Good afternoon and welcome to you all. My name is Nina Downs. I'm the Director of the Parent Engagement Team here in the Department of Education and Training. Um, first of all, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. I would also like to extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were present. We're so pleased to see so many people uh, here today, both from within the department and so many external people. Thank you so much for coming. We've been working with the Australian Research Alliance for Children and Youth, known as ERACI, on the Parent Engagement Research Project. We're very excited that we can now share with you some of the work that has been going on. The CEO of ERACI, Stephen Bartos, is here with us today. Stephen will shortly introduce the presenters and will tell you more about ERACI and about this project. But first, to give you some context for the project and the presentation today, I'll start by telling you what I'm sure most of you know, that parent engagement is very important. Evidence shows that increased parent engagement is one of the key factors in improving a student's education performance. Children have a greatest chance of success when their parents hold high but reasonable expectations and provide a home that encourages and supports education. The Australian Government recognised this by making parent engagement a pillar in its Students First Education Policy. It continues to remain a key focus for the Government. One of the activities supporting this focus is our work with ERACI. The research project we're here to learn more about today is an element of the bigger ERACI project. It looked, looked at parent engagement in different contexts and will give us insights into the engagement of parents and families from different cohorts. But now I'll hand over to Stephen Bartos, who's going to tell you a bit more about ERACI and about this project. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Nina. And like Nina, I'd like to pay my respects to the custodians of the land that we're on, pay my respects to their elders past and present, and acknowledge any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are here in the audience today. And thank you for your contribution to our life as a country. Look, this parent engagement project is one of a number of activities being undertaken by the Australian Research Alliance for Children and Youth, ERACI. ERACI collaborates strongly with your department on a number of really important issues and has for many years since its foundation 14 years ago. Uh, ERACI is set up because of the conviction that was formed by a number of leaders in the field of children and youth in Australia that we needed to actually apply a more preventative approach to stop problems arising in later life, and that we need to make sure that programs worked in this country by using evidence, uh, which sounds like a, uh, a terribly obvious concept, but is more often not done than is done in Australia. It's very important to work out what works in terms of interventions for children and young people so that we can apply our limited resources to where it's going to make the most difference. And that's really what ERACI exists for. If you want to find out more about ERACI, I am actually doing a talk right here uh, at 10 o'clock on Wednesday. So, so I, I, I think everyone in uh, this cluster was invited to come along to that. Feel free to come along to that if you want, because I want to talk more about parent engagement. As Nina has said, the evidence both internationally and now growing in Australia though partly this project is about growing that evidence, but, but what we do know about Australia and certainly know about uh, the rest of the world is that parent engagement makes a big difference. That to the extent that parents can work with their children on their learning in a way that complements what happens at schools or uh, prior to school, uh, 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 making sure that children already know how to learn in so many different ways, whether it's literacy, whether it's uh, uh, speech or social interaction, uh, a number of, number of different ways in which children's early learning is, is really vital to their success at school. It, 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 it all makes a huge difference. And what this project is about is providing the evidence on the one hand, but also the practical tools uh, that will enable parents and teachers to collaborate so that we can get parent engagement embedded in the normal day-to-day -day activities of Australian families and Australian schools. And that's going to uh, be good for all of us. And so what that leads to is a parent engagement project that involves uh, various different inputs in terms of evidence, about what works, and we're going to hear a lot 
about the evidence in relation to some particular segments of the population in a moment, but also a framework to measure what works and measure progress and keep improving it. And without that measurement framework, we won't be able to continuously improve the way we do parent engagement. And there's uh, essentially four interconnected streams to this whole project that we're undertaking with yourselves in the department. Um, looking at what works, as I mentioned, uh, building the profile so that people understand this. Uh, amazingly, uh, a large number of Australians still don't understand why it's important. Building that profile, building that shared understanding. Uh, the measurement framework and a specific strand that looks at Indigenous Australians. So we're looking at what works for, in this session today, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children, uh, children from culturally and, and linguistically diverse backgrounds, uh, low socioeconomic status, and, and, and children in a family uh, with disability. And that uh, is, is what we've asked Western Sydney University to look at. Why Western Sydney University? It's because the Centre for Educational Research has a reputation for excellent research into educational disadvantage. Um, they're, they're leaders in this country on that, and so they've been asked uh, to help with this project, and, and they are delivering in spades. Understanding parent engagement within the types of families that they're looking at uh, will greatly extend the reach and the value of this project. We've got three people from that research team with us today, and I'll introduce all three and then they'll come up each in turn to speak. Uh, but uh, Chris Woodrow, Associate Professor Chris Woodrow, is a Senior Researcher, Deputy Director of CER at University of Western Sydney. Her research includes early childhood policy, um, uh, parent involvement, literacy, numeracy, and uh, in particular, um, pedagogies in vulnerable contexts. So that, that's uh, perfectly uh, on all fours with the type of work that we're looking at in this project. Margaret Somerville, Professor of Education and Director of Centre for Educational Research, conducts research uh, across early childhood schools, communities and professional learning. Uh, she's engaged in participatory research with parents and teachers in vulnerable communities and published extensively on Aboriginal people. And Loshni Naidu, Senior Lecturer in Sociology of Education at University of Western Sydney, is interested in refugee, migrant, Aboriginal and low SES students in Greater Western Sydney, school university partnerships, language and literacy development. As you can tell, highly qualified group of people uh, to take us through this material. Uh, it is uh, a crucial part of this parent engagement project. I'm looking forward to hearing what they have to say just as much as you. And on that note, I'll pass over to Chris. Thank you very much, Stephen. Can you all hear me? Uh, we've got a fairly tightly um, put together presentation, so we're going to move uh, fairly quickly through um, what we have to <coughs> offer you today. So my role initially is to in introduce this research. We're very excited to be here today to give you the, um, some of the insights. We won't be able to cover all the ground. Um, we have um, identified some pretty rich um, perspectives across the country. Um, in that research, we have certainly produced some, some challenges. Um, and I think uh, across the findings, um, quite a diversity of um, aspects to pursue. So uh, our um, consideration of parent engagement is a broader view that goes beyond what's taken for granted as parent involvement in schools. We've taken a, a view at trying to understand the perspectives of, of learning of both parents and, and schools and, and educators. So what, are, what do they think about how children are learning and, and what are their respective roles? How do they see their own roles and the, the roles of the other being either the parent or the educators um, in, in that learning? with the broader view of engagement as a more um, umbrella term rather than 
being involved in, in school. And we think that's opened up a lot of potential in the research by taking that broader view. The third aim then to identify from what the parents and educators are telling us, um, what the barriers are to their engagement and what are the enablers. And fourthly, of course, based on that, to make recommendations. So in relation to that, um, our way into this research was to ask the, these uh, key questions. So where do you think children's learning happens? So to tease out you know, the um, tension between school and elsewhere, what helps children to learn? What does successful learning mean? And you'll certainly see some diversity around that. What is the role? How do you see the role of parents in children's learning? Um, how do parents help children to learn? And do what parents and families do make a difference to how well a child um, achieves and learns at school? So to try and kind of capture in some depth these uh, perspectives, we took an ethnographic approach and divided the research across these strands. So strands where the research is perhaps not so um, strongly represented um, across the literature set and to take a kind of specialist view in particular areas. So our strands, as you can see, were across Aboriginal communities, culturally and linguistically diverse um, context, low SES communities and children with special needs. We were able in this national study to um, undertake more than 50 focus groups that involved more than 150 educators, um, support personnel and um, representatives from NGOs and 160 parents. Um, and we then uh, created our data analysis um, in a way that was able to enable us to um, produce a set of case studies, which is what our report essentially is comprised of. So having done so well now, we're going to move into the research findings and I'm going to ask Margaret Somerville to speak to you about the findings from the Aboriginal parents and schools. So thank you, Margaret. Thanks, Chris, and thanks for everyone for being here with us today. So I'd like to add to the acknowledgements, my acknowledgement of the Darug, Gundungurra and Darawal peoples uh, of the land where I work and the, the many peoples uh, of the lands where I actually did this research. So what I'm going to try and do is give you an overview of the main points that came out of the project but also to read you some of the Aboriginal voices. Because one of the really difficult things for a non-Aboriginal person is to communicate the sense that the Aboriginal participants gave of uh, their feelings and thoughts around Aboriginal parent engagement in children's learning. So, just to talk about recruitment, so we had 14 groups um, and interviews were conducted with 72 participants. So there were 31 Aboriginal parents and 39 teachers spread across urban, rural and remote New South Wales. We had no Torres Strait Islanders because of the sites that we uh, researched. The 31 Aboriginal participants uh, covered a huge range of carers. So I've called it Aboriginal parents throughout the report, but it involved parents, grandparents, members of extended family, custodial parents. Um, that was about it. And I just called them all parents, but they all came along to talk. And the Aboriginal people that came along were incredibly, um, it was very important to them for their voice to be heard. Everyone, as I've said here, said to me, Aboriginal parents won't come. Um, that was the, the feeling uh, across the board in every single instance. And what I had to do was to use my very extensive networks from over 20 years of research in Aboriginal communities in, across New South Wales and Victoria, um, starting from my very early life of living on remote communities in the desert. So I drew on all of that 
and in every case, the recruitment was different. So sometimes I worked through AEOs that I have a close relationship with. Sometimes I worked through Aboriginal elders. Sometimes I worked through community members. Um, and every group, um, therefore, was different because they were different sets of connections. Uh, the focus groups were incredibly challenging and I'm really glad that I've worked with Aboriginal people for so long because um, we would expect 10 people were turning up and then one would turn up or we would expect two and 10 would turn up or they would turn up at a different time. Um, they would turn up at a different location. They would turn up over a period of time. Quite often there were children would come along. Uh, we had one instance where the catering was in the middle of the table and one of the kids kicked a football into the middle of the sandwiches and they went everywhere. So it was kind of chaotic, but. Actually, it was fun. It was huge fun and a massively important project. And the Aboriginal parents felt that they hadn't had the opportunity to have their say before and that this was their opportunity. Um, so what, what came out of it was actually 400 pages of transcript. And you can imagine the task of reducing 400 pages of transcript to something that's communicable to a public audience. Um, so what I did with the Aboriginal parents was annotate every one of those transcripts so I could be absolutely sure of capturing what they said and then picking out key quotes that I thought represented each of the points. So we went through the same questions with every single focus group and one of the advantages of that and I guess I wanted to say that, that one of the really important things about this project was that most projects I've done with Aboriginal communities have been very local, very specific and very ethnographic. And in this case, Eracy asking us to come up with 300 participants altogether was a really big challenge. But in the long run, it makes you feel like you really know something and you can really say something on behalf of people. So what I'm going to do is read through most of the things that I've found and most of the things that Aboriginal, well, the key quotes that Aboriginal people said from this first question, because this first question frames the whole of their responses. So the response of Aboriginal parents to the question of where, where learning happens is a key to understanding their engagement in their children's learning. The responses were remarkably similar across urban, rural and remote sites. All Aboriginal focus groups and interviews responded that home is where most learning happens, but they extended home to include learning from community and in different places. They said, for example, everywhere you go, you're learning, something new every day. You're learning from the day you're born. It could be anywhere. It could be out in the bush. It could be learning to surf. For Aboriginal participants, learning begins with birth or even pre-birth and continues throughout life. Learning is about deep time as well as about the present because it includes learning from ancestral stories of the deep past as well as stories from elders about more recent history in particular places. It includes learning for future generations for cultural continuity. And I felt that this could be understood as an expanded and expansive view of learning that we could all benefit from. So the findings in this section about where learning happens were divided under the following sections. Aboriginal culture as conceptual framework, early learning the first teachers, land, language, history, story, and learning respect, an overarching concept. So I'm just going to read you quotes from each one of those thematics. So the first quote is, a lot of Aboriginal people is taught at home because it's not taught in the school. So we talk about our culture at home. We talk about our ancestors at home. We talk about living on a mission at home. We talk about our mission school. We talk about what it was like to live on missions in the country what we used to do as kids compared to what these kids do. So they get a bit of history, they get a bit of life stories, they get all that sort of stuff at home, 
where they learn about all their backgrounds and all the things they talk about. So early learning first teaches. Well, at home you learn to talk and walk and crawl, communicate, socialise. They emulate their parents and their family on how to behave. They learn how to interact with other people. They imitate the family, their interaction. With the families, because they're big families, there's always cousins. There's always kinship comes into it. That's where all the learning takes place, with all the kinship coming in and sharing and playing, enjoying what we have, our barbecues, meetings and things like that. So urban Aboriginal parents continue practices of learning about country through storytelling. When we drive like out country, when we drive out to Dubbo, just all the stories I had to share with the kids, I was surprised at myself. But I had all the stories my grandfather and my uncle, two old people, always told when we would go for big drives. Always had a yarn about different houses on the way, on the road. The fencing, because a lot of my family, grandfather, were always fencers, shearers and all of that. When you go out country, you see all that their stuff. So that's part of storytelling. So learning respect. This was a really interesting one for me because I'd heard people talk about respect for years and years and years, but never until this project really understood the depth of this concept. So <clears throat> these concepts of land, language, history, culture and everyday life are held together in the overarching notion of respect. Respect is underpinned by reciprocity. And while this reciprocity relates to everything that exists in relation to all other things, it is particularly derived from learning country. Respect as an overarching concept bridges home and school and is used frequently throughout the focus groups. In the remote site, the notion of respect was explained through the concept of river rules, which the Aboriginal parents referred to extensively as it is applied in the school. So this is their quote. They're still learning some of the language, so they say good morning and do river rules every morning. You teach them at home about the river rules. You've got all your fishing spots, meeting spots. You've got boomerang, black rock, sandy bank, and all that. They pick it up at home as well as school. Every classroom has got a river rule painting in the room with different areas on it, and they do a different rule once a week. Yes, teach them to be safe and respectful owners because the river is a big part of our lifestyle out here and the kids do respect the river because a lot of their food comes from the river. That's why we use the river as our guideline as safe and respectful learners. So Boomerang Island is the respect or Sandy Bank is the movement rule because here there's all different rocks and things. That's how it fits in with our school rules with the river. So reflects, respect was explained as a concept that links past and present, the elders, the history, the future, and respect for people, property, tools and things. By these means, children learn to respect their culture, their history and where they come from, but also how to behave in relation to others in schools as well as in the community. Significantly, while the Aboriginal parents spoke at length about the river rules and respect, the practice was not mentioned at all by the white teachers at the remote site. OK, so I'm not going to go through these in such great depth and I'm hoping that what we can do in the Q&A session is for those of you who want to follow up on any particular ones of these points to um, ask me about them. But I've chosen one quote from one of the themes in each of these just to give you an idea of what the parents are saying. So this one I chose was from understanding different ways of learning and applying them in school. And, and I guess what I need to say here is that they talked about oral learning, visual learning, hands-on learning, 
body language and all of that sort of thing as being really important for, for what they think about their Aboriginal children, but also about what they think about all children learning. So this quote said, all kids are oral kids. If they hear something first, if I was telling a story about something, that kid will be interested in it, what I'm talking about. Because if it's about animals or if it's about something that they're interested in, then they're going to sit and listen. That's why we speak. A lot of our culture is oral and visual and hands-on. You find if it's for our kids, it's for all kids. They all learn the same. Okay, so what does success in learning mean? So I had quotes for each of these. Um, but of course I can't fit it in in the time. So I've chosen the first one uh, and that's actually words from this quote. So th this really impressed me when I said to this mother who was very strident about her feelings about Aboriginal children in the school and very, very keen for her voice to be heard. And she said, well, for me, successful learning, it just fills my soul, my heart up with much happiness is when I've seen a child, any child or a young person, and they're not doing well in life, you know. Dramas at home, drama, you know, they struggle all the time, hardship. Then I see them, like a school comes together and works really hard on that child, and then that child starts succeeding in life. So for all of the Aboriginal parents, they, um, they talked in terms of success of, um, I guess, supporting a child where they're at and, and taking huge sort of pleasure and pride when they make any gains at all and focusing on the gains and the positives. So the enablers of Aboriginal parent engagement, you really have to read the report to, to see this. This is the reduction of, uh, of quite a long table that talks about all the different sorts of things that work to enable Aboriginal parents. The, the predominant thing and the reason why I put it first was the need to establish relationships. That was absolutely key for Aboriginal parents. Relationship building was it. It was everything. It was over and above everything else. And then there was things like educational en engagement and programs with outside agencies and, um, and out of school learning, of course. So the common barriers that were identified by both Aboriginal parents and teachers were these. So, so family pressures, the sorts of things that we all know about, family pressures, poverty, drug and alcohol addiction, domestic violence, um, negative experiences of school, low levels of literacy and education, um, lack of new knowledge of new methods of teaching and learning and parents being time poor. But in terms of this, I guess one of the things I need to say here is that Aboriginal parents focused very much on resilience and strength. They didn't actually dwell. They talked about the families that have problems with alcohol addiction, kids in custodial care and all that sort of thing. But that was always second to their focus on the strengths and resilience, the things that Aboriginal culture, having survived for as long as they have. Um, so these were parallel barriers identified by parents and teachers. And I developed another table where I could see that parents had one set of barriers and school teachers had another set of barriers and they had parallels across each other. So lack of cultural knowledge of non-Aboriginal custodial parents uh, and the teacher's equivalent was the instability of Aboriginal children's care arrangements. Uh, different language of parenting, different cultural practices, and the teacher's sense of inad inadequacy in relation to Aboriginal protocols and sensitivities. Uh, intergenerational change and loss of cultural authority, and for teachers, the impact of technology on family life and communication. And for parents, emotional difficulties, 
kids becoming angry at school, parents becoming angry at school, children who are angry, and for teachers, um, parents' fear of being judged and concerns about Doc's involvement. So teachers had some sort of sense of that. OK, so, so findings and a way forward. How long have I got, Chris? Um, three minutes. Three minutes, OK. So I'll just quickly read my conclusion and you can read those um, things here because my conclusion, I think, summarises the, the overall sense of Aboriginal parents and teachers. So from Aboriginal parents' perspective, the most significant finding from this study is that Aboriginal participants have an expanded and expansive view of learning in which time and space place are understood differently. Significant learning for Aboriginal parents happens outside of school, in extended families, in community, in country and place. Deep time is significant and includes learning about ancestral past, future and so on. In common with all other parents, Aboriginal parents want their children to do well in school. School learning is important, but is only understood in its relation to all other learning. Aboriginal parent engagement in school learning can only be achieved through building a relationship between Aboriginal families and schools in which Aboriginal culture knowledge and practices are respected. The ability to build this relationship is seriously impacted by the effects of colonisation, intergenerational trauma, ongoing racism and structural inequalities for Aboriginal families and communities. In relation to this project, Aboriginal parents express the strong hope that their voices will be heard and that there can be continuing honouring of their voices in further professional learning for them as citizens and equals. Teachers, on the other hand, considered home and school as equally important and offered a very different view of learning. In almost all cases, teacher, teachers considered that there was no important difference for Aboriginal parents engaging with their children's learning than for other parents. The lack of knowledge, confidence and skills in relation to Aboriginal families can be deduced from their responses. The main variation in teachers' responses appeared to be the complex school ecologies, which includes the dimensions of leadership, collegiality, quality of teachers, socioeconomic status of communities, and so on. Both schools and teachers expressed a strong desire for further collaborative development of their capacities in this regard and continue these important conversations in the future. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. We're a well-oiled machine, as you can see. <laughs> Um, look, it was very remiss of me in my um, introduction to the research project not to acknowledge um, Aracy and the um, um, delight, I guess, and also the um, sense of uh, collaboration and achievement that um, kind of typified our, our engagement with Aracy. And we were very, very pleased to have the opportunity to undertake this research that um, really has um, cut across areas of expertise or particular understandings that we as researchers have had um, and enabled us to, to bring previous experience in a, a way that we think has really added value to this research in the um, context of a relationship with an organisation like ERACI. So thank you very much very much for that opportunity. Um, I think it's uh, fair to say, and you would have had a fairly good taste of that from Margaret's presentation, that the data that we have uncovered is in, indeed rich. And not to be outdone by uh, the Aboriginal um, communities and schools context, um, the low SES context, which I led, also produced more than 400 pages of of transcripts. So the kind of management of data in the project has been huge and it is very difficult to actually um, assimilate common themes while preserving the richness of the data and the idiosyncratic nature 
of some of the findings and because they might not be themes doesn't mean that what we experienced in a certain location is not highly significant and I think that's what really came through the research for me um, in the low SES context is we had such a diversity of points of view both from the school and educators perspectives and from uh, the parents but each of those perspectives were nuanced and re really important to take um, account of. But one of the shared perspectives was certainly that home is a place where values are inculcated and produced. And I think that creates a really fantastic starting place um, for schools and families and communities to collaborate when you acknowledge that home plays that critical role. So for the remaining kind of five minutes that I have, what I wanted to do was just pull out a, a couple of key insights around an incredibly rich um, data set. Uh, so one of them relates to this dot point three here, which is the value of contribution of the home experience is not always recognised by parents. So we would be more familiar with the idea that it's not always recognised by schools. But in fact, uh, in my engagement with a lot of um, families, they, it took them a while to realise that some of the things they were already doing with their children in the out of school space was actually contributing to their children's learning. And for those parents who had been able to reach that understanding, that was accompanied by a sense of empowerment and, and contribution. But um, on a number of occasions, that really was, made quite a profound impact on me. There was this idea that we do these things, um, but it took some probing to get there, but the value that those activities of cooking with a child, doing home activities, going somewhere, actually had for their learning was not recognised. And I think there's some potential there around how to work with that. Um, from the schools, um, a pretty strong theme was where schools were doing well with parent engagement, it tended to be idiosyncratic to that school and that community rather than systemic. So there was somebody on the staff or a principal that was really committed and was driving that idea. There was a particular resource in the community that enabled that to happen. Um, there was something special about that place rather than that it was a shared kind of commitment or ideal um, you know, across the education endeavour, if you like. Um, and I guess that throws out a challenge to education departments around how to build um, systemic parent engagement in a way that is not then controlling and constraining uh, parents. That um, in my interaction with schools in, in that context, there was a, a reasonably strong theme of a lack of awareness and understanding of the effects of structural inequality. Schools seem to be under an enormous amount of pressure, partly to do with reform agendas and all of, all of the things they have to do, a lot to do with resources. So there was a lot of referring back to when, uh, to when we had such and such money, we were able to do such and such. So when we were a disadvantaged school, when we did did this. So there was a kind of hankering to the past when resources seemed more available and schools communicated um, on the whole a strong sense of being kind of under the gun in terms of their capacity to resource communities that are really needy. Um, and that played out in a variety of, of different ways. Uh, one of the other key findings from the low SES context related to um, kind of communication issues and mixed messages. So where schools might say, we have an open door policy here, um, you might also find in a little notice on the window of the school office, it says parents might, must make a, an appointment to see the principal. <laughs> so there's these kind of mixed messages that go unremarked but um, make it very hard for families to find the place where, where they do fit. I would say almost every family that I engaged with across the three states where I travelled, um, those families wanted the best for their children and they saw education as 
you know, the way out of the disadvantage, the cycle of disadvantage in, in which they were um, existing. But schools didn't always appreciate um, that that's where parents were and the complexity of some parents' lives where just getting the kids out of the door for the day was probably as much as they were going to be able to accomplish. Okay, with one minute to go. Um, where uh, there, are, there were parents who were engaged, there seemed to be a lot of potential to use those engaged parents as, um, or to leverage them if you like, to use a kind of neoliberal term, but uh, to engage with those parents as mobilisers of other families. So that seems to be an area of, of potential. Um, and I might finish with a discussion of the, the NGOs. Um, I was able to interview a number of um, representatives from NGOs who are active in these schools. And there's a great deal of ambivalence and ambiguity around the roles of these organisations in school communities that um, probably deserves some greater research, but is very interesting indeed. Um, and you know, one, one principal said, look, we like having them, um, but I wish we had the money so we could do with our own, what we liked for ourselves rather than have to kind of do what the NGO tells us. So um, yeah, plenty to explore there. And now I'd like to hand over to, um, to Loshni. Thank you. As indicated by speakers prior before me, I've worked with culturally and linguistically diverse uh, parents uh, in the demographics of New South Wales and Victoria. According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the 2015, 28% of Australia's population were born overseas. That's equivalent to 6.6 .6 million people with 200 languages spoken in Australia and 16% of that being uh, languages other than English. <clears throat> As a researcher, it was challenging at times to work with uh, the focus groups that consisted of several languages being spoken and with interpreters working with the focus groups as well. But it was also quite rich data that emerged. The parents in both the demographics had very different understandings and experiences of school, despite the similarity in demographics and the um, slight curricular ch challenges. We worked with uh, Catholic schools, uh, independent schools and public schools. So there wasn't a great difference, but there were still uh, very different understandings. Parents generally agreed uh, that learning occurred in the home and the school, and they saw themselves as performing a supporting role for the schools. There was a heavy emphasis on academic learning, and when I inquired further as what they thought academic implied, they said homework, supporting student learning, discipline, again here, discipline concerned with classroom management, and curriculum content. There were several key concerns of parents. Firstly, homework completion. And I will, and here they were talking about the fact that educators would constantly give students homework, but didn't necessarily follow up in the classroom with the completion of the homework. It was difficult for parents to understand course content. The genres used by teachers was quite different to that used by parents. The curriculum was not challenging enough for students. There was a limited use of textbooks. There was a high dependence on worksheets. There was a cultural mismatch between parents and educators. And there was basically what they thought was a lack of respect and discipline. And I do want to read a quote from the one of the parents regarding the textbooks. The parent goes on to say that there are no textbooks. We don't know what they're taking, but at school there's nothing. They have a maths exam. 
We don't know what's in that exam. They only have worksheet, worksheet and worksheet. Those worksheets do not explain anything. We wanted to help the kids to learn. We want them to study. And that gives you an insight into you know, the way parents actually felt about the use of wor worksheets and the lack of textbooks. The educators, on the other hand, felt that parents were far too reliant on them to take control of the child's learning. They felt that they were, the parents' uh, support was limited to classroom management in that they only saw parents when they had to come up to school to talk about their child's behavior in the classroom. The parents' lack of engagement by educators was perceived to be as a lack of interest in school. And those parents, they felt, that needed the most to engage with the ones that were the least visible. Uh, again, a quote from the educators who said, I think it's important in this day and age that parents take an interest in what their kids are doing. I've been to situations at the school where the parent and child are meant to be coming up for an information evening. The parents on the phone and the kids trying to absorb the information for their subject selection or whatever else. Yeah, it doesn't set a good role model when the parent doesn't take the role of the parent. And what the, uh, what the educator is talking about here is the fact that parents come with the child to the parent evening, uh, parent teacher evening, but the parent's busy on a telephone conversation and the child is left to do the selection of uh, subject selection. So due to their lack of sanctioned cultural capital, and knowledge of the Australian education system, many parents with limited English do not have the skills uh, to engage and therefore delegate responsibility to their children. Parents are unsure how to influence educational policy and educators' pedagogy as they felt ill-equipped educationally to intervene in the school process. And, and this is what they have to say about school discipline. From my experience, children who do that, act out in the classroom, do so because they're not being challenged. So academically, the work is not of an appropriate level for them and it's not stimulating. So that comes back to the teacher, not giving them enough to keep their minds active. The school system is failing these kids. The schools have got a lot to answer for. They need to change their teaching strategies because they don't all learn the same way. And here, the, uh, obviously, the parent referring to the fact uh, of differentiated learning. So what are some of the barriers and enablers for parents? The barriers are lack of cultural capital to engage effectively in the school system. There's no common language, particularly with second language speakers, so there is a breakdown of communication. Time work constraints. Many called parents are working long hours and find it very difficult to take time off to engage with their child's learning. Because of the language difficulties, they encounter social isolation and cannot engage with the school community. And their lack and failure to acculturate and understand the Australian education system means that they are further marginalized by the school system. Enablers, good planning on the part of the school, a move from involvement to engagement, understanding the language barriers of parents, intercultural understanding and sensitivity, and connection with families. And finally, if we look at the plan of a school with a successful called parent engagement, we have translation services available, community liaison officers working at the school, bilingual teachers who could serve as interpreters as well, a strong teacher professional development, effective two-way communication between parents and the school 
and strong community links. Thank you. Thanks, Lashni. Um, it's now my um, role to present um, uh, a couple of comments on the special needs um, cohort. This research strand was led by Dr. Kerith Powell. And um, it's very important to have um, these voices represented. In many ways, I guess, there, there weren't very many surprises in the findings here. The, um, the needs of special um, needs contexts have been quite well documented th through research and advocacy over the years. Um, but at the same time, uh, it's critical that those voices are included in any research um, of this kind. So there were a couple of, um, gosh, I'd better put you on the right. Oops, there we go. <laughs> uh, a, a couple of key insights that are, have come for that. I mean, obviously, in the special needs context, when you're talking about special uh, classes and special school contexts, then um, children's learning goals, um, how they're going to get there, are more negotiated between the school, between the health, uh, health professions that are involved and the families. And what this research identified was a strong, um, strong involvement, if you like, uh, of the parents in those kinds of, of contexts. What was a little um, more um, interesting, I, well, the other is interesting and important, but perhaps a bit surprising, was this idea of uh, what people were learning from the children. So there was quite a strong theme that came through in several different ways about how children with special needs teaches others in the school community, um, in the wider community, um, and in the professions, um, enabling the development of compassion um, uh, uh, and greater understanding of um, what it's like to, to belong. That secondly, success is defined in different ways. So across the research, we mostly got um, uh, fairly typical responses about how, how do you define success. But in the special needs cohort, it's very individually defined and more specifically related to um, children belonging and participating rather than kind of achieving. So that in itself is, an, is another kind of, um, um, what would you say, a, a different um, perspective to hold on to and something unexpected about what, what we can learn um, and bring back to something that might be more mainstream. Uh, and so this idea that everyone learns from everyone else and that success um, can take many, many different forms. Um, I'd like to uh, use the remaining two or three minutes to um, talk about the findings and recommendations um, across the project. We came up with motifs for each of the cohorts and the motif for the um, low SES context was struggle. So schools were struggling with all the demands that were being made upon them to cater for the kind of socio-economic um, demands of their particular communities, of uh, catering for children who really were living on the edge, uh, for responding to the um, imperatives of their school systems. And parents were struggling to understand how to negotiate school systems, um, social service systems and, and so on. For the special needs, that motive was chaos, that it was chaotic in, in a good sense, you know, you couldn't universalise it, it was um, diverse and diffracted. Um, but across the cohorts, um, we could make the, um, some of these following comments, that there are differences in perspectives between parents and schools. That there is a clearly emerging imperative for meaningful and sustained dialogue between communities, communities being families um, and education um, institutions. And as I mentioned earlier in my um, presentation, that effective 
parent engagement at the moment tends to be idiosyncratic rather than systemic. That we were able to identify some kind of generic, if you like, barriers and enablers. So the first barrier is this communication issues, clashes of values, not really understanding the perspectives of the other. The um, issues around fa family pressures and in incapacities, and in some cases, and, and not all, and I certainly don't want this to be a, un, um, perceived as a school bashing activity, but a very strong um, deficit discourse. In, in schools, you know, and if you take into account feeling under the gun, then when um, schools are doing their planning, coming up for air, th what they're seeing is what they don't have, what the families don't have, what they have to try and fix, rather than um, what are the capabilities, contributions, um, skills, knowledge and, and understandings of their communities. And I think that's a challenge to all of us, actually. Um, so what kind of educational supports, uh, oh sorry, um, and lack of specialist knowledge. So this idea that within schools and education institutions, there, um, there's a benefit or, or there's a barrier with this lack of specialist knowledge about how to work in particular kind of communities, in Aboriginal um, school communities, in low SES, in called, uh, in special needs. So what are the enablers? Establishing relationships and good communication. So a strong theme is obviously in relationships first. Uh, providing educational supports for parent engagement in ways that are meaningful. Um, working through what it means to incorporate programs with outside agencies. So that um, relationship between the school and its community agencies. Um, we saw examples of where that was working very well and other examples of where that was deeply problematic. And the possibilities around enabling creative, informal and out of school learning. So out of that, what kind of recommendations might we make? Um, and I'm sure my team would add, add more to these, but in, in a sense of trying to um, encapsulate some of the research, uh, locally and collaboratively develop professional learning, training and resources for parents and educators. Um, so within a systemic approach, actually providing supports for locally and collaborative de developed professional learning. And an investment in community relationships with the provision of key personnel to in integrate cultural knowledge um, and cultural relationships. Training for schools and parents in uh, capacity building, communication and change strategies, improve resourcing of parent support, school community liaison personnel with appropriate knowledge and training, and models of parent engagement that are inclusive, culturally sensitive, and capable of diversification at local levels. So that real tension between systemic but not universal. Something systemic that is able to be adapted and responsive to local community contexts. Um, I'm sure that we haven't covered the um, entire spectrum of these findings, um, the barriers and enablers, but I hope we've been able to give you a taste and we look forward to your um, questions. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'll invite all of our speakers to come up and join me here. And I'll invite you to think, while we're all gathering, about the questions that you're going to ask us. So we're all here waiting for your questions. And I'm, I'm looking uh, out at the sea of faces. Wondering who's going to start. Thank you. Um, what there's a mic. There's roving microphones, so the microphone's mm -hmm. coming to you. So you, your your question can be captured on the uh, film tape for posterity. Very good. I better make it a good one then. Um, Question open for all the panel. Um, one of the things we've been seeing recently from studies on te teacher welfare is that one of the things they're currently finding most stressful is the um, new expectation for teachers to be available 
pa to parents for, via email outside of work hours and even for telephone calls and also the increased um, expectation that they will be make themselves available to correct student draft work. What are your thoughts on how we can best balance um, what we're hearing from those sources and what your findings state and how we as policymakers can can help with this dilemma? Um, what came out quite clearly uh, in the data that I collected was that uh, court parents were particularly against the use of uh, technology to communicate um, but with the schools. Uh, there was an assumption uh, on the part of the schools that all par court parents had access to um, the email, computers, iPhones, SMS, um, and also they felt that you know they would have preferred to have had the hard copy of the newsletter uh, with some sort of interpretation so they had an idea of what was going on in the school. Uh, they resented the fact that there was a heavy reliance on information technology. So, you know, that's prob probably something we need to think about. I guess from my point of view, that sounds like a particularly middle class problem, um, that there's a lot of pressure from middle class parents and parents who want their children to perform. And what you see in the overall picture is that that's not the case with, for example, Aboriginal parents or low SES parents. They're not pressuring the school. So again, I guess my perspective would be that the school needs to a certain extent protect parent interests and teacher interests. But over a period of time, I think that we can get it much better, get it much more right in terms of how we do parent engagement in schools, how we actually build those respectful relationships where each side understands the other and there aren't those sort of pressures and burdens. Um, I guess the other thing for me is one of the fantastic things about this project was for both teachers and parents, but in, in your question, particularly for teachers, for the teachers to actually get together and talk about these issues is really significant. They, they don't get together in this structured way, even finding a time for them to come together. But once they come together to talk about any of the issues and how those particular issues feed into the larger question of children's learning and the school working better is a really, really significant thing. And I don't think there's any clear answer um, that can be applied across the board, but I think schools are capable of solving those problems given the, the time to actually get together and do it. And certainly one of the uh, perceived barriers to parent engagement is a perception by a number of teachers that it's an additional task in, in what's already a very busy week. Um, whereas in fact, uh, uh, if parent engagement is done well, it makes teachers', teachers lives easier. But there may be one exception, and I'm going to raise this with, with Margaret, and that is I was interested in on one of your uh, findings, uh, which was that one of the barriers was teachers' lack of understanding of Indigenous culture. And obviously, to understand properly uh, the culture of uh, a community in which you're teaching takes actually a, a quite a deal of effort. Where should that come? Uh, Pre-service or should it be done as part of the teacher's uh, training or, or how do you build that in for uh, the teacher who's assigned to an Indigenous community? I think pre-service it's important that teachers have exposure to Aboriginal voices and Aboriginal teacher educators. But I don't think that that's the whole answer. I think all teachers really learn to teach when they begin teaching and they learn teaching in community. And for Aboriginal communities, uh, it's really significant that teachers know that community and that particular place. Uh, and my view was that there would be a fantastic sequence to this project where we actually worked on developing not teachers, not necessarily teachers professional learning about Aboriginal culture, because all of the Aboriginal community there has that. But if but in in my sense there were these two 
parallel things in operation. Teachers who had fantastic skills and great intentions and could offer a huge amount to Aboriginal communities. Aboriginal communities who have fantastic cultural knowledge, language knowledge, but there is no connection. So teachers don't necessarily need to know it all. They need to know how to tap into the resources. They need to know how to work with their Aboriginal education officers. They need to know how to talk to Aboriginal people. They need to know how to listen. So they don't, they don't need to acquire a skill of knowledge about, but they need to learn how to establish those relationships. And that's what the community is saying. Yes up here. There's a microphone running up the stairs towards you. Hello, thank you very much for your presentations. Um, my name's Kelly. I'm a senior social worker in Aboriginal education here in the ACT education system. And during my question to the panel is during your research, um, how well understood do you feel that power imbalances were, particularly in terms of uh, white privilege? Thank you. Okay, so I'll, I'll answer first, but the others might have something to say. Um, I think Aboriginal people very well understand the power imbalance and white privilege. Um, and I think they're very generous about it. Um, what amazes me about Aboriginal people is that after more than 200 years of the most extraordinary impact of colonisation, they are still willing to, to listen, to teach, uh, to engage. But from teachers' perspective, it was really pretty appalling. I was fairly amazed that even the best intentioned teachers at the end when I asked them the question, do you think it's any different for Aboriginal parents than it is for other parents? They all said their first response was always no. They don't think it's any different. And then they would say, they would think about it a bit and they would maybe have a couple of comments to add. It's not a lack of intention, it's just that they have never had that experience. They have never had to walk in other people's shoes. Um, so the way, but they want to learn. Um, but, but as I've said to the last question, the way to learn is to establish relationship. It, it's not to know about, it's to be able to relate and to understand. And the situation in Aboriginal communities is still stark and is still absolutely um, appalling from the point of view of white standards of what we accept in terms of a way to live. And teachers need to learn that and they need to learn it by being able to talk to people in their communities. Yeah, I don't think I've got anything to add to that, Margaret. I think it's a very powerful story. Mm -hmm. This one's a question from right in the back row. Thank you. I was interested how you think the experience of parent engagement changes as children get older. Like whether it makes a big difference to the level, how welcoming the schools are, all those things, yeah. Thank you. Um. I had the opportunity of interviewing parents in primary and, and secondary schools. Uh, there was a very clear indication that at the primary school level, there was greater opportunity for uh, parent engagement as opposed to the secondary school. And I think much of this had to do with the nature of the activities and the uh, structure of high schools as compared to primary schools. Uh, with fewer opportunities uh, at the high school levels, for parent engagement. So certainly there was much of that happening as students kind of moved on to high, high schools. 
Uh, one of the interesting things that I found around that was um, a diversity of views about whether kids wanted their parents engaged. So the, um, the more common and popular view that some parents and more teachers expressed was by the time the kids get to high school, they don't want to be seen dead with their parents, you know, they don't want them near the place, etc. But in fact, some parents really disputed that and talked in ways that I found quite emotional, actually, about what a difference it made to their kids when they actually showed up. So I began today by saying we, we talked about parent engagement as not being only about showing up. But in fact, for some of these families in the low SES uh, context, they were very disappointed at the complete lack of opportunity to participate in school events, and that's how they perceived it, um, and express that both for themselves and from the point of view of their children. So nothing straightforward. In my experience in relation to that, um, I had a really lovely experience with a group of people at um, a high school in Western Sydney. And the parents in that situation, it was their, their hope was to be involved at a different level. And they wanted to form a committee that could actually inform school decision making, um, particularly around issues of racism, uh, bullying. So the, the issues that they wanted to address were at a, at a higher level, I think, at, at a different level than what happens in primary school. Uh, and they wanted to be involved at a different level. So they wanted a committee that was actually recognised by the school hierarchy, uh, where they had a mixture of um, younger parents and elders who could actually comment on what was happening for Aboriginal children and comment on curriculum. If you're not going to ask a question, I'm going to ask one, because one of the things that struck me from those presentations, uh, the finding that amongst low SES families, uh, a number uh, didn't see uh, that there was a really strong uh, role at home for contributing to kids' learning, whereas with the Aboriginal families, this very fierce commitment to learning culture at home and that home was where culture was and, and this huge emphasis on that, that home learning. Uh, do, you, do you think uh, maybe Margaret or Chris, there's, there's something that some white families can learn from uh, the Aboriginal families about how to get learning uh, into the home environment? Uh, I've thought about this a lot, actually, because what, one of the um, sites that I went to um, was it, it, uh, at a child and family centre. So the child and family centre had actually arranged the, um, the venue and the parents who were from the primary school um, to um, participate. And there was a very strong relationship between the um, Child and Family Centre and the school. And the two uh, parent focus groups that I conducted there, those parents had a much stronger sense of how they contributed to their children's learning. And I don't think it's a stretch of the imagination to say that that had been fostered by their earlier engagement in the Child and Family Centres. So, there's a role there about early childhood education in um, strengthening um, parents or families, if you like, um, sense of their own worthwhileness and what they can contribute to their children's learning. And then I think there's a bit of a challenge that perhaps we need to think through about how that continues on into the school. So some schools talked about how they run kind of um, sessions for, te for parents about how they teach maths and how they teach literacy. Um, and some parents talked about that as a positive kind of thing, um, about how they could learn what they could do at home. And other parents talked about that as not the kind of engagement they wanted from school, they wanted different things. So it's a bit of a roundabout answer to your question, um, but I certainly think there is a role for strengthening um, in low, SES, low SES communities, the understanding that families 
might have about how they can contribute to their learning, but for it to be done in a way that's not um, kind of condescending or, you know, instructional. <laughs> and I think that comes back to that idea about developing learning communities. And I guess the situation with Aboriginal parents um, is paradoxical in the sense that they have these this sort of parallel sense of their school learning and then there's cultural learning. Mm. And they they're because there's no crossover, they don't have a strong sense that the kind of things they do in cultural learning impact on success in school. Uh, and in fact, there's a big question about whether it does because of the lack of valuing of Aboriginal cultural knowledge in schools. If, if our schools valued Aboriginal cultural knowledge um, or Aboriginal English or Aboriginal languages or so on, it might be different, but it doesn't work very well in the crossover sense. The, the best place to see it work is in the best of the Aboriginal education officers who understand the two-way process. So they understand how the ways that school learning can be used in, in the home, in the everyday things that you do with children. Mm. And that makes school learning and Aboriginal cultural knowledge come together in a way that it doesn't normally do. But I see that as the potential for further engagement in this project where Aboriginal parents who really want to know how to do this better and teachers who really need to know how to do it better engage in understanding these issues and how that crossover can better work. I think you could make massive gains in Aboriginal education outcomes by working on that. Mm. Yes. I just wanted to add to that to say that uh, parents thought when they spoke about the cultural mismatch between te uh, teachers and parents, um, they spoke about the fact that teachers did not draw upon the funds of knowledge that the students, that called students, brought with them to the classroom. And they felt that had the funds of knowledge been used, uh, there'd be a much, it, it basically would empower them as parents and empower the students as well. Mm. One down here. Um, thank you very much for your presentations today. And also, um, I just wanted to ask, uh, with the low SCS cohort, you mentioned that um, one potential avenue to explore is where parents are engaged. They could potentially be used to mobilise other parents to achieve broader parent engagement across that particular community. I wanted to know, firstly, whether that similar type of approach could be used or applicable to the other two con um, three contexts that we spoke about today. And the second thing is, noting that's a sort of bottom-up strategy, when we're looking top-down, there are a lot of differences in the barriers to parent engagement between the different contexts um, of disadvantaged students. So how is government to tackle this problem of improving parent engagement in these contexts? Thank you. A very, <laughs> it's a very interesting and a, a very challenging question. Um, I think it's undoubtedly true that by engaging more parents, you engage more parents in the same cohort. So by providing, if for example, you take one school, so, so my Aboriginal parents were all in parallel with a school, and you worked to develop the capacities of those parents to engage with their children's learning both in school and out of school, then that would necessarily, because of the nature of Aboriginal communities, spread to other Aboriginal parents. It would ease the burden on Aboriginal education officers who just simply cannot do all of the things that they have to do. Uh, as to how you would work that across the different cohorts because of the very big differences, I think that, they're, that that's what teachers do all the time. I mean, in another project, we're talking about complex classrooms that involve high Aboriginal, low SES, and high multicultural. And we've worked with those schools. And what we're doing is trying to understand the sorts of pedagogies that teachers can develop that work across 
that complexity. So I think that we can theoretically walk across those complexities, but there, there are going to be community, individual and group kind of take up of it in different ways. And I think if we don't recognise that, we've sort of lost it for a start. So, so yes, it, it's a mixed and a very complex problem. And Australia is a very, very complex society at the moment. And, and these are challenges that we absolutely have to take on for the 21st century because of the nature of our school populations and because we cannot afford, absolutely cannot afford, to leave huge cohorts of children behind. We have time for one more question. Uh, two, if this is a short question. <laughs> But what if I do a two-part question? <laughs> so my question is, the types of parents you interviewed, would they be the parents that would be likely to be attending parent-teacher interviews at school generally? Could I? Yes, Lashni? Yes. Um, that's a really interesting question because I found that a little problematic in some schools. Uh, I found that when the schools invited the parents, they in certainly invited the parents that had connections with the school, uh, you know, would have been part of the parent-teacher association in some cases, uh, which meant that they were not as vocal or as honest as I would have liked them to have been. I think they were very conscious about um, being very aware, careful about what they were saying about the school. Uh, in some cases, I think it was open to all, all parents. Um, and I can recall in one instance where the school said they had never had such a turnout before. Um, did they wish they, that many parents would come to the parent teacher night? And they, they said, what have you done with the parents in there? Because they haven't stopped talking even after they left the interview. So I think they, they thought then that it was a really good idea to have regular forums with an external facilitator mm -hmm. so that they could kind of keep in touch and give more voice uh, to parents, basically, you know. Uh, so it differed, I guess, in different schools. And I, I would say not, not necessarily. Um, you know, a, a number of the parents that I spoke to um, used terms like, I feel judged by the school, or I only ever get contacted by the school when there's trouble. <laughs> you know, so, so those people are not in a hurry to show parents. up. Sorry? So was there any recommendations then on how we connect better with those parents, with that demographic? Well, I, I think a, a lot of it is around this meaningful engagement. So, um, and again, you know, I think the role of the NGOs and the school community liaison people uh, is potentially very rich. I think... Um, uh, it's not a linear kind of thing. Oh, let's use the NGOs to do this. I think it needs to be very carefully explored um, through where it, it works satisfactorily. But I think there are mechanisms to engage communities in dialogue. And, you know, I like Loshni's example by, by the intervention itself. You know, we always love research as an intervention. But by the intervention itself, it actually mobilised um, some action as a byproduct. But in my case, I, I have to say the same as Chris, that it varied. So, uh, but in, in many instances, it was parents who would never, ever have been in a school or go to the school. Uh, and, and the same that I think building on the capacity of those parents then builds capacity more generally. Now, I'm sorry, there were... At least two more questions, one up there and, and one down here from Michael Kindler, but time has got away from us. Is this going to be your last opportunity? Absolutely not. Here's my chance to give you an advertisement for the Parent Engagement Conference next year. This project has been going for a while with the department and it's continuing into 2017. So uh, it's, this isn't the end of the conversation. This is, if you like, uh, a halfway point or a, or a partway point into the conversation. As you could see from those presentations, parent engagement 
is challenging, it's diverse. We had a presentation about four different groups that are very different in terms of what's needed in relation to parent engagement. That creates a challenge for the ERACI team who are working on designing a measurement and evaluation system. Hopefully we'll be up to that challenge. You'll find out if you come along to the Parent Engagement Conference. Uh, it has a huge number of international keynote speakers as well as uh, terrific Australian speakers. Uh, we do suggest registering early if you've got an interest in parent engagement because numbers will be limited and uh, uh, there's already, uh, even though uh, it's not open for registration, uh, uh, it, it doesn't open till 31st October, uh, there's 200 people who've contacted us to put their name down saying that once registrations are open they'll be, they'll be uh, getting their name in. So uh, uh, please keep an eye out. Uh, on this uh, website uh, for that conference. Uh, it's been an absolutely wonderful uh, set of presentations from Margaret, Chris and Loshni. Uh, can you again join me in thanking them before I pass over to Nina. <laughs> and final remarks from uh, one of the most important collaborators in this whole project. First, because of policy responsibilities. Second, because of having the money behind it. Uh, uh, but, but third, because they're, they're such wonderful people to deal with. I'll pass <laughs> over to Nina. Um, thank you all very much for coming along today. Um, we're really delighted to have the response that we got. Um, for all this further information you've just received about the conference, we will be sending out a follow-up email um, for everyone who registered and those that um, showed an interest but couldn't come. We'll send you a link to where all the, the research report is just, Tim, just gone up, just gone up on the internet today. Um, so we'll send you a link to see the research report and show you more information about the actual uh, project and the link to the conference because that's going to be very exciting, so we're very pleased about that. Um, again, I just wanted to thank all the presenters. So thank you to Stephen, Professor Margaret Somerville, Associate Professor Christine Woodrow, and Associate Professor Loshni Naidu. So thank you all so much for coming. We're really pleased, and um, thank you for presenting today. So thank you, everyone. Please join me in thanking thank the presenters. Thank you.